Last week there were many prophetic words given over some people. I want to just, uh, the Bible says to, to um, uh, weigh up the prophetic gift, weigh up the prophetic word that comes. I want to speak a little bit into that this morning because I heard lots of prophetic words. We were given one. And, and how do you receive a prophetic word? The Bible says to weigh it up, to, to judge the word. And firstly, the word of God, that, that prophetic gift comes. And uh, I, I really feel to say this, that the prophetic gift does not replace our relationship with Jesus. It, the primary thing that Jesus did for us is to bring us into a place of fellowship with him. We sang his name all morning. And it is the, the prophetic gift has come to encourage us into faith, but it does not replace that relationship. It's not the primary deal. The primary thing that we should always come back to is our sweetness of that relationship with Jesus and walking with him as our Lord and Saviour. I've noticed this over the last season of, of my walk with Jesus and you know been in a few other churches and so forth and I've noticed this that when people give a testimony they've started off back in the day it was a testimony of what Jesus has done in my life and that has changed somewhat to the things I've noticed from testimonies from here and there is people start to testify about how the church has helped me and that sh there's a shift there has been a shift in, in just I'm not speaking about us, but generally across Christianity, there's been a shift away from relationship to Jesus to relationship with the church. I don't know if any of you have noticed anything like that. And uh, it's good to be a part of the congregation. And the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering together. But the primary purpose, the primary relationship that we should have is with Jesus, is with God, is with the Holy Spirit. He is our God. And it's out of that place, out of that sweet relationship with God that we should find our leading and our direction and our purpose. And when the prophetic comes, it should encourage us into faith, encourage us into believing God, encourage that relationship, but it should not replace that relationship. It should not lead us outside of that relationship. And sometimes we're looking for a prophetic word to encourage us in the midst of difficulty. Like uh, Ruth was saying, we can go through seasons that just aren't pleasant. And, you know, all of you know what I'm talking about. You've all been around long enough to know that we have seasons of life. There are seasons that sometimes put pressure on us and we're looking for encouragement to our souls. And so we look for the prophetic word, but it should not replace that relationship with Jesus. It, and anything that the prophetic comes should crystallize what God is saying already within us. I remember um, when, when, when uh, uh, we first met, remember him? And uh, um, he prophesied, we, we allowed us, him to come and, and speak at our, our hub around there and, and uh, Neil and I turned up late and uh, he called Neil out and prophesied over him four times during the course of that night. And when the prophet comes and the prophetic gift is to see in the spirit on what's a person's life. When it operates in me, oftentimes I see a person's gifting and, and you know, what God is saying to them. And Greg prophesied over Neil and he read his mail. But he put, he put it in this context. He says, you're going to do this and you're going to do that and, and God's going to give you a big boat and you're going to take people out and get to know them and you're going to do this. And all he was doing was talking about what God had already done. But because he put it in the context of you are going to, in a future tense, it sounded like God was going to do it again. But he had already done it. So he'd read his mail very, very accurately, but the tense was not right. And so it's very easy to get a prophetic word and think, oh, that's, that's going to happen. But what happens is there is, there, is, there is information that we pick up in the spirit but we've got to be very careful how it, we phrase it. Is this making sense to you? Because it's supposed to encourage us into faith, into believing God, into walking with God for the purpose and the grace that God has got on our lives. Because sometimes we're just in a different season. Hello? 
And so it's important to weigh up these prophetic words that come and understand that it does not replace what God is saying to us, but it can help crystallise and it can sharpen, but it's, we've got to maintain that sweet relationship with Jesus to put it in its context. It's got to witness with our spirit. It's got to be theologically correct, but it's not designed to replace that relationship. We've got to keep that prophetic gift understand how it works so we hear it rightly. Otherwise, we can just be led all over the place by somebody giving me a prophety, prophetic thing and I'm going here and I'm there. They've seen something of what God has got on our lives, but it may not be the season, may not be the timing, and it may not be how God wants to fulfill it. It's so important that we come back into that place where we hear God day by day, walk with him through every season and every circumstance and allow that relationship with him to be the primary thing that leads and guides. Hello? So I just really feel strongly to say that. Faith is what we should walk in. God has designed us and called us to partner with him. So when he speaks these things into us, we have these prophetic things that come that just confirm what he's already got in our hearts. Hello? So when we have this thing in our heart from God, we've got to step up into faith and believe God for it and, and put our partnership with God. Sometimes we can have this thing that can come and, and we can just look for the sovereignty of God's going to do everything. God's going to do this and God's going to do that and it's all sovereign but that's not how it works. We've got to have some faith on the inside that says, I am going to walk with God and I'm going to give him something to work with and make this come to pass and I'm going to do my best and partner with God. That's how faith works. God speaks. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But then comes <clears throat> circumstances and situations that seem to be the total opposite of what this word says. Anybody experience that? Now the trial of our faith is more precious than gold that perishes, it says in 1 Peter. <coughs> the trial of our faith. So we enter into this thing where our faith gets tried. It gets pushed against. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Faith is spiritual substance. It's not just trust. Trust is part of it because it comes and we start to walk with God about what God has said and we're trusting God for the for the, for the thing that he has spoken and the word that he has spoken to us. But there's different aspects of this walk of faith. When I believe that Jesus died for me, I receive saving faith. And I become born into that family and I become alive to the things of God and they become fresh and real to me so I can walk in them and, I, and I'm saved. But then God begins to speak to me line upon line, precept upon precept, and he begins to build in me. You know, there are, there are 16 names of God in the Bible. And those names represent different aspects of who he is. And as we walk with him, and as we see him and get to know him, he begins to reveal to us his nature and his character, and we become partakers of of his nature. Let's read through Hebrews 11 a little bit. And because I, I just really feel that this is the, the journey that God has got us onto. You know, it's good to have those prophetic things, but we've got to be people who lock a hold of God by faith. I'll share a few of my uh, experiences and journeys on this and how it works because I want us to, to step up and to believe every promise that God has for us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead, still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. 
By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and he became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. And it goes on to say <coughs> all about the, the people of faith. I want to I pick some of these aspects apart. Faith is substance. By faith, the worlds were framed. It's more than just trust. If we think it's just mental agreement, we've got to think that God, by mental agreement, made the worlds. But it doesn't say that. It says, by faith, the worlds were framed by the word of God. It wasn't just a mental thing from God. It was something of the substance of God that he spoke and the worlds were created. Now, when we receive something from God and he speaks to us, it imparts that same faith substance into our inner being so that we receive that which we can then partner with God and begin to speak out of that place of what God says into our heart. It's the substance that creates and makes full and forms and brings the answer of God into being. For God spoke and called those things which be not as though they were. And when we partner with him, it begins to, begins to come out of our spirit and we begin to speak and to form just as he did. Does this make it sense? So when God speaks and something comes on the inside, and it comes alive on the inside of you, and you begin to speak out of that place of life and begin to declare, then answers come. They come from the Spirit. And this is where we are called to be. We are called to be people of the Spirit who walk as spirit people, not just natural, not just thinking natural, not just looking at natural things, but people who partner with God, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And you and I can speak in this place and live in dominion as Christ has called us to. That's what I'm believing for. That's who we are. That's who we are. It's a, it's a place of life and dominion. It's a place where the, the life of the spirit flows outside of us and even though our outward bodies might just you know start into creak here and there our inward man is renewed day by day hello that's a good thing isn't it yeah, it's absolutely a good thing it's a good thing i tell you i feel stronger in my spirit than i ever have I feel stronger in my inner man I feel like we're stepping into a new realm a new dimension a new place in the spirit than I ever have before, just growing stronger, building. So I'm encouraging you into this place. God has called us to walk in dominion and not allow uh, uh, things to speak to us and to call the shots in our world, not allow our bodies to define who we are, not allow our age to say, okay, well, you're too old for that. I went mountain biking yesterday. And I'm riding and, and you know, going down this steep hill and, and uh, Wayne was with me, going down this steep hill. I thought, that looks steep, my goodness. Hope I don't fall off. And went down one steep hill after another and up another steep hill after another. And went down this gully and oops, over I went, head butted a tree and, you know, took a bit of bark off. And people could say, you're too old for that. I'd say I'm old when I feel too old. And I don't feel too old yet. I'm enjoying it. We've got to enjoy life. We've got to take dominion. Hello? Don't, don't allow your age to define you. Don't allow your circumstances to define you. Don't allow the things around your world to stop you from being who God has called you to be. Hello? You and I are called to walk in dominion. There's so much more in the Word of God about this, about being people of faith and being people of life, being people of the grace of God, being people who walk in this place and begin to speak and declare 
We sang that song this morning. I speak the name of Jesus over my family. I speak the name of Jesus over my kids. I speak the name of Jesus over my home. I speak the name of Jesus who is King of kings and Lord of lords and he's Lord over my household. He's Lord over my family. He's Lord over my kids who are no longer walking, uh, living with us. He's Lord over them and over the household. He's Lord over my daughter who's married an unsaved man. He is Lord over her. He's Lord over my, my youngest daughter who, who's you know, just running around doing all sorts of stuff. He's Lord over her. I declare it. I speak it. I speak the name of Jesus over my family. Hello. Come on. We, we've got to step up. We've got to step up. But there is a trial of our faith when God speaks. I came from a, a, a very, oh, well, my dad was born in 1984. And so he grew up during the, you know, a very impoverished time when they had to ration everything. And, uh, you know, he grew up with this mindset of never enough. So when I grew up with my dad, he was nice and passed on that mindset. It's what families do. They pass on certain ways of looking at things. And that mindset of never having enough. Then I got saved and I found out that God was a God of abundance. And one of the things that God has continually done for me has been to reveal himself as a God who provides. And that's been one of the great trials of faith in my journey because God has begun to shift my whole mindset about that. I've spoken about little bits of it. But as I look back over this season of trials, what it has done is it imparted some faith into me about who God is. Just like Sarah judged God as who he says is faithful. God is faithful. And this journey that he's had me on, you know, when I first got saved as a young man, 18 years old, and God spoke to me and said, the just shall live by faith. And I thought, that's awesome. I'll live by faith. Then I found out what that actually means. I found out it means that you don't rely on, on government funding. You don't rely on, on this or that. You rely on God. And what happens is we get into situations which pressure us to not rely on external provision, but cause us to look to God. And sometimes the very circumstances that we are in that are against the word of God are the very things that he's got us so that we look to him for that answer. Hello? This is the trial of our faith. Whether we are going to judge him as faithful who will do what he said to us in our spirit. And that's why the circumstances look so different. That's our trial. And so we've got to choose whether we're going to believe God or succumb to the circumstance and look for another way out. And I would have this battle in my mind as a, as a young university student with no money and, and God said that just shall live by faith and God, how am I going to pay my bills this week? What am I going to do? And I'd have the battle in my mind. And then I started out pastoring. And most of the time I was just believing God to survive. How are we going to survive? How am I going to pay for my family? How am I going to pay for the kids? I'd get into my prayer room and call in the provision. God, you said that, that, that uh, you know, <clears throat> you'll supply all my needs according to your riches in glory. You will supply all my needs. God, I've got to pay this bill. And the phone would ring, can you come and work today? And work some casual work here and there. And, and the phone would ring and God would provide. The next week, God, how am I going to pay this bill? What am I going to do? The phone would ring, can you come and work? Uh, then, then, you know, I'd go for a season without any work and, and uh, you know, I'd have a few bills all lined up. Now, you've got to realise that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, that was a lot of money, $1,000. God, how am I going to pay this bill? I've got $900 worth of bills. And so I thought, well, if I get $1,000, I'll have to tie the 100 So uh, that'll give me 900 left to pay my bills. God, I need $1,000. God, give me $1,000. I need $1,000. And I felt God speak into my heart, the money is coming, $1,000. And oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Jesus. You're going to give it to me. Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for answering. Thank you, God. You're going to provide. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We could go by. Nothing. Next week. Oh, God, you're going to provide. Oh, God, thank you. Oh, no, nothing. And my mind would start to battle with me. And this is the fight of faith where you begin to deal with every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, you've got to bring down those thoughts and bring them captive to the knowledge of who God is and judge Him as being faithful. And uh, what, how, how are we going to... You said, God, you said somehow, oh, I haven't got any money. It hasn't come yet. God, oh, shut up, mine. Stop. And I'd have this inner battle going on. And, and uh, just... Pushing into God. You said, God, you said, and I'm fasting and believing God. It's battling within myself. You said it, God. I, I'm standing as much as I can. And a month went by. And a phone call from a pastor in a neighbouring town. Can I come and see you? Yeah, sure, come over. Turned up. And drove an hour. Some of you might remember Bob Collard, great man. Good old Bob. Said, hey, Tom. Hey, Bob, what are you visiting for? Well, God spoke to me and said, I'm going to give you some money. He handed me an envelope. I opened it up, $1,000. Thank you, Jesus. So relieved. Oh, thanks, Bob. When did God tell you to do this? Oh, about a month ago. <laughs> I, I was supposed to thank you, but I just felt like slapping him. So. <laughs> but see, what happens when God begins to come through again and again and again and again is that he builds a faith on the inside of us. That substance begins to grow where our expectation that God will do what he said he would do. And again and again and again, God has built this thing into me that I know God is provider. I went through a, a you know, a decade later, I, 15 years sometime, I went through another season where I lost everything. Lost everything. I think I've told this story before too. I lost everything. And I was just grieving about losing everything. God, what am I going to do? And God spoke to me again about that I live in a river. You've heard me say this. I live in a river of provision. It's not just a one-off, but there is a river. Money goes out, there is more coming in. And I would introduce myself, hello, I'm Tom, I live in a river. And just had this faith in my heart. And in a very short space of time, I was given a whole house full of furniture and goods and because I had nothing. My life had fallen apart, I had nothing. But I had this fresh faith on the inside. I live in a river. The provision of God came to me afresh. And God showed me another aspect of who he is as provider. That it's not just a one-off, but there is a river of it flowing. And so now, somebody asks me for some money. I, I, okay, how much have I got? What can I give you? How can I help? Because I know the river is coming. If it goes out, more is coming in. But if I don't empty it out, it stops the flow. So I've got to learn to go with the flow of God's provision and be a giver and it flows. And so then I enjoy giving because I know that's a river that flows and I can give and there's a flow that comes with that provision and that flow from heaven. Is this making sense? But it comes out of this place of faith of knowing who God is and the expectation of his character and his nature. And there are 16 aspects of this in the names of God where he wants to reveal himself bit by bit by bit. That's been one of the primary ones that he's just provided for me. We and Deb and I would go through circumstances and situations. What are we going to do? Well, you've got to change jobs. Oh, hello, Deb. Just If you want to leave your job, come and talk to me. She's got a new job. I'd, I'd you know, leave one place of employment. Another would come along within a week. The provision of God again and again and again. And as I look back you know, at the times and circumstances, something on the inside of me has just built so strong and so firm about who God is in this context. 
And so I don't know what trials and situations and circumstances that you have walked through or you are believing God and lifting to God for, but there is a trial that makes us push into the presence of God and push into who God is. Though the fig tree may not blossom, though there be no fruit on the vine, yet I will praise him. As we press into who he is, into his nature and his character. One of the things that we are here right now is, are doing is having our congregation, our church, who we are. And, and as I look around, I see such good people, solid people, foundational people. You're like the pillars of this church. But as I look in my spirit, I see so much more. I see so much more uh, of who we are as a congregation. I see you as the foundation, the pillars, the rock that cannot be moved. But as I look at our congregation, I tell you, I've just got so much more in my spirit. I see so much more. And some of our people have come and said the same things and, and spoken to us aspects of what they see. And, and they see us, you know, with this place full and vibrant with people. That's an outworking of what I see. Because what I see in my heart is, is something so profound. And, and as I pressed into God to seek his kingdom first. And, you know, the things that I've been preaching have just been aspects of his kingdom, about who he is, about who the king is. And he's just been showing to me and revealing to me fresh aspects again and again and again about who he is. And through this trial and through this season, I'm seeing freshly, again, aspects of God about who he is and about the life of, of what God wants to do within our midst. And, and, I, I, I just see it so strongly. And, and so, you know, one of, the, one of the things that has happened is, is I've met some people who are beginning to think aligned alike we are. I met a fellow called Paul Gibbs, who you may not have heard of, and it astonishes me because this man is a great man of God and he has sent tens of thousands of young adult missionaries around the world into local churches. And he started a movement called PACE, P-A-I-S, when it means young student or something or other, P-A-I-S. And if you want to look up his website, it's called PACE Movement, P-A-I-S, Movement. This man has sent tens of thousands of young adult missionaries from every continent of the world into local churches. And we have an opportunity for that here with us, for us to receive for a team, not just one, but a team of four young, young adult missionaries into our local congregation. And, and so these young adult missionaries come. Their assignment is not to just come and work in the local church, but it's to be missionaries into the local high school and to train up and send forth other young adult missionaries, to train people and to disciple them. One of the things I really believe that we will become as a congregation is a disciple-making church. It's part of who I am. And so I'm, I'm believing for, that to, for the grace of that to flow over us as a congregation. Let's have a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Have we got it there? It says this, And the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And we have this progression of discipling. Paul, speaking to Timothy, says, The things you've heard from me, Timothy, teach others who will also teach others also. And so we have these four generations of discipling from Paul to Timothy to faithful men who will teach others also. And I'm believing for the grace of God to come upon us as a congregation that we will be a disciple-making church because it's how I'm wired and it will reflect who I am, a, a trainer, a teacher, a disciple-maker. Now, I understand that many of us ha have, you know, it's, we're, we're in a different season of our journey. So I, I want to phrase it to you like this. And then I see Barbara who wants to start a, a, a ladies' meeting with a, with a friend. I hear Keith and Jenny, you want to do something in your village and make disciples where you're at. I, 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 that just excites me so much. I love that. Because this is fulfilling this commission, this call, this purpose that, from God that we have. And these, if we can get these young adults into our congregation and, and 
that every one of them has a commission not just to do 15 hours work in a school each week, but to disciple three other young adults. You imagine if we get four young adults discipling another three, that's another 12, suddenly we've got 16 young adults in our congregation. And, and you know, so not saying that young adults are everything, but it would bring a, an engine room, a dynamic a help, a, 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 a momentum that, that we need that I've got faith in my heart for. This is what I'm believing for. And I see this momentum flourishing and growing and influencing. And see, <clears throat> we've thought about church in some ways, and if I could just talk church life for a little bit. We've, we've thought about church as, as a meeting that we go to. But we're, we're supposed to be having influence and salt and light. You've heard me preach on that before. It's about what we do. And so what happens is we have one person, here I am speaking to you, one person speaking to many. But if we all become disciple makers in some shape or form, then we have many speaking to many. And I'm looking at what Paul Gibbs has done in sending tens of thousands of young adults around the world, and how come I haven't heard of him? Because he doesn't make it about him. He makes it about many speaking to many. He makes it about multiplying who we are, doing who we are. And, you know, we can easily throw up obstacles. Oh, I'm too old. I don't know anybody. There's, you know, it's too hard. There's, you know, all this sort of stuff. But the very basics of our Christian walk with Jesus is that we talk and walk with him. We read the Bible and we pray. Is that right? Read the Bible, pray. Read the Bible, pray. I married my wife. We sit down to meal together and we talk. We are one with Jesus. We read our Bible and we pray. And if you can't do anything else, you can pray for us as a congregation that we would have the grace of God. For God says that we come boldly before the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need, that God would give us the grace as a church, because I don't believe that we've walked in this much, that he would give us the grace as a congregation, as a church, as a body, to be disciple makers, that the grace of God would come upon us because this, I see, is an engine that will change the dynamic, that, that will just, it becomes a multiplying, empowering thing that will take us to where we need to go. Are you hearing this? I see this, I see this, because this, this can change who we are. And, and rather than just, uh, you know, the foundation of good godly people, it will take us into that momentum, into that space. I've got faith in my heart for it. I can see it in my heart. Now, if you cannot see it with me, because it does come from God, and I'm asking you to pray for it, that you would get it for yourself, that you would have a faith and come into agreement and we can partner together to see this grace multiply over us. If you cannot see it, if you're just looking naturally, I just ask that you do not be a minister of negativity, just speaking what you see naturally and just speaking smallness because it's not who we are and it's certainly not what's in my heart. Are you hearing me? Because we've got to be people of faith. It's nice to have a prophetic encouragement, but it's our faith that takes us into that journey, walking with God and seeing the answers of God come. And so many people have come and spoken to me. I see this happening. I see this happening. But we've got to step up to it by faith and accept it and receive it, judging that he who promised is faithful. God has promised us, and I believe he is faithful. And sometimes we can butt heads with the trial, and this just looks so opposite and different to what the promise is. But we will just accept that God is faithful and that we will do what he has called us to do as we partner with him and as we put our best foot forwards. One aspect of this, <clears throat> with this PACE team, to, to get this PACE team, we've got the finances. We give a small amount of money. We've been given that. We've got the money. But what we need is host families. We need host families. Somebody who can put up somebody in their home and feed them for if you can't feed them for a year, give them three months. 
give them something. Because they're coming as missionaries to work with us. And if you can't do that, then pray that God would make way for that. Just And if you have difficulty with your budget to be able to provide for that, come speak to me and we'll help you with that. I'm really believing that these people, there, there is just a, a paradigms of discipling and that engine room that would be really helpful for us. I'm believing for it. I'm believing God to make way. I'm expecting it. I'm not hanging my whole hat on that. I'm hanging my hat on God. He is the one who makes way. But here is an opportunity that we can partner with. We can partner with and see God work. I think it's a great opportunity. And if you think that's a possibility for you, come and talk to me, please. We need room for four. Deb and I are considering how we can take one. You might be able considering how that could work for you. But, um, and, but if you can't, pray that God would make a way for us as a congregation because uh, nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing is too hard. I see that as a great opportunity. But I also see in my heart that if that doesn't happen that way, God is going to make it happen another way. Because God is the one who has spoken it into me that we're going to grow and flourish and have a great future and step into all that God has for us as a congregation to see disciples multiplied, to see that influence flourish through our community, to see the grace of God flow and work, to see people just uh, being saved and discipled, coming back to that place where they have talking about what Jesus did in their life, not just what they, how the church has helped them. Hello? This is, I, I, I'm just so energised by this that I see this is something that, that we can realign ourselves with the purposes and the plans of God. Hello? Can you lift your eyes with me and see God do this? I just see it. I, I see it in my heart. I expect God to do it somehow or other. God, God is going to make a way for us. He's going to make a way for this next season, this next uh, time, this next uh, great place where the grace and power of God can flow uh, uh, and we can be the, the foundation that helps carry and urge on that next generation. Thank you, Jesus. Give me a wave. Tell me you're hearing me. <laughs> this is what's in my heart. I, I just... I, and I've been trying to move forward with this for a season and just felt like we've come out of a stalemate now. We can move on. I've got something burning within me to, for this. The grace of God is going to come. And I look at you and I see foundation people, people with, who are pillars of the faith, people who, are, who will stand and pray and agree with me, people who will, who will carry the life of what God wants to do to this next generation. There is a grace and a goodness of God on it. And in the midst of that, every one of us goes through our own uh, trials and things that we're believing for, whether it's for health or provision or, or, or family or something. And, but I tell you this, we are going to judge him who promised as faithful, that he is well able to do everything that he said he would do, that we will press into him in the middle of every trial. We will count it all joy, not looking at the natural circumstances as defining us, but as what God says defines us because he is the one who is our rock. He is the anchor to our soul. He is the one who carries us through the midst of every trial and every difficulty. We will walk with him because he is there, our sweet, sweet saviour. Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, I pray that you would speak. You would encourage every person here today. Father, as we, as we lift our hearts to walk in faith with you, Jesus, we thank you, we honour you for it. We magnify you. You're our Lord and Saviour. You're our God. In Jesus' marvellous name. Amen. 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 Murray. I've, I got a picture what Tom was just preaching there and I thought I, I'd better speak it out. There was this, there was this big, like, like a big block, a plain block and there was uh, uh, like a big shelf on the bottom, and Tom was walking backwards and forwards. You were walking backwards and forwards, and like looking me. at this, facing this big block. And I mean, you were, you were here, and the block was up here at the top of it. And you were thinking, how can I get up there? How can I get to the top? 
because you knew that's where God wanted you to be. Yep. And then this big ladder came down, this big wide ladder, and there was two steps on the bottom that the top rungs were missing. And the Lord said to you, you climb those two steps and then I'll provide the other rungs. There we go. To the ladder. There we go. That's a step of faith. Thanks, Mario. That's awesome. A step of faith. He'll take you on the journey. He'll walk with us. Yeah, I just want to just add what Tom has been saying. Um, talking about these, these young people, um, these, these four people from the PACE movement, they just have such um, heart and a passion for the, the power and the presence of God. And it's like, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I'm just so excited to see that God's given us a strategy and the financial um, amounts coming for that, like just like an overnight, this, you know, so quickly that it was just God's all over it. But it's like in the midst of the busyness that I see coming, I, I just know that we have an anchor in Jesus and we have an anchor in our, in our passion for the presence of God in everything that we do. And I just want to just declare that, you know, we are a church that values the presence of God above anything everything. else. Above it doesn't matter, you know, it's not about, like Thomas said, about having the, the, the flashing lights and the, the smoke machines and I want the smoke of God's presence in this place. I don't want a smoke machine, you know, and I'm sure we're all exactly the same. But I just want to let you know that our focus is primarily upon God's presence being in the midst of everything that we do so that you guys know that this is a, um, a safe place where you can come and you can drink from the well, you can be in the river of God, you can be in a place where the word of God is foundational and sound and secure. And with these young people, if it comes in and it gets crazy and we grow and grow and grow, we all know that we have this anchor in Jesus hey. and the presence of God and that is our number one goal in everything that we do. There we go. So we just want you to know that. There okay. we go. There we go. I just want to encourage you. I just want to encourage you that God is with us. He is with us, the presence of God. He has not left us. He has not abandoned us. And he is true to his word. And we judge him faithful. Father, we thank you today for your word. We honor you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. If you want prayer, we are here. But I just want to encourage you with that, that we're on track for what God's got for us. God bless you.